Tēnā koutou katoa, g'day. Never try and finance the curiosity of an engineer, I once heard, and it stuck with me. See, a lot of ours, like me, come to events like this, and we talk about the need to embed simulation in the design process early. It's actually really difficult to do. Bring in the analysts and progress can grind to a halt. That it's valuable, I see on a weekly basis, we um, specialise in embedding that analysis in the design. Uh, as an example, a couple of years ago I had a client who spent $100,000 on iterative design and they really didn't know where they were at after that. And they came to us and they said, look, we've got two questions, can this be done, and if so, how? They gave us a budget of $4,000 and within that we are able to do some basic design, um, run some uh, basic research, sorry, ran some calculations and out of that math came the answer. And that product is successfully on the market today. And I'm not saying it's $100,000 versus $4,000 and I'm a big fan of iterative design. Absolutely so cheap, easy and valuable compared to the planning fallacy. And we've heard that a bit, like from Peter Beck earlier, the move fast and break things approach. But it can be really cheap. As an analyst myself, tonight, or today I'm going to pack on the analyst a little bit and some of the reasons why it is hard to do this. Analysts can be a bit rigid. They can have one view of an appropriate scope. This is how we're going to do it. Anything else is cutting corners. And analysts hate to cut corners. They can be over conservative. Don't like to be wrong. We just heard about a guy downstairs talking recently about failure, how to get failure into research and um, the importance of that, learning from that. They, uh, they can get stuck in the weeds, they're detail oriented, which is great because we want them to analyse stuff, but they can just get lost in these loops and endless detail and spend a lot of time on products that, or components that don't even make it to the final product. And they like to be certain, and the more analysis work they do, the more certain they are. And the more analysis work they do, the more problems they see, and hence we get into these spirals of projects blowing out and estimates not being worth anything. So I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with Agile. Uh, we have a philosophy called Better by Analysis and Motivated, and we use uh, Agile, Lean concepts, also just learnings from 20 years of doing this stuff. What we're seeing here is a typical Agile product development, where on the left we've got a minimum viable product, um, and we're learning as we're going, they're delivering stuff, they're actually, they've got an idea of requirements, but they're refining them, they're testing those requirements not as a prediction of the future, because no one can predict that, even with the best mark for research, but as hypotheses to be tested. And so we're testing things out, and the problem we see with the analysts is they'll sometimes spend a lot of work so analysing that, but then it doesn't even make it into the final product. And we can apply these same ideas to simulation, so that's like how to do that. So minimum viable simulation, so this is akin to Eric Reese's minimum viable product. Minimise batch size. So rather than spending a lot of time analysing the death out of one particular component or system, we have a light look, a quick look, and a lot of things and we slowly converge as the data comes in, as we get more confidence about what the actual design is going to look like, converge on an answer. The time box work. You shouldn't have to do it if you minimise the batch size, but if you actually provide a set um, amount of time to do the work in, rather than it's a free-for-all, tar blanche, analyse what you can, if you make them fit it within a box and separate out the time for the documentation, so that's ring fence, so the documentation actually gets done, <coughs> it doesn't get swallowed up by the analysis, that's really good. Moore's Law, this is something Peter mentioned as well, computers have come a long way, but we still it's almost the norm. We still see a lot of analysts who spend half a day simplifying a model to save 30 seconds runtime. And there are cases when you have to simplify models for accuracy, but often uh, the trade off, the return on investment is not there. Train designers and analytical methods. As an analyst, I know how difficult it is to get real, like, quality test comparable results from final element analysis, for example. 
that takes a lot of training. But it's actually quite easy to teach people to do um, comparative analysis and optimization. So I've got basic mechanics and materials, material science, and it's really good because it cuts down the whole throwing over the fence problem. Validated learning. So coming back to the importance of documentation. Unless you document the work and make it really available to the organisation, it's almost worthless in my mind, unless you're really, really small as an organisation. A3s, trade-off curves, that sort of stuff's brilliant. And this is one of the keys. If you want an analyst to move fast, you have to make it safe for them to fail. And... So this will remind you, this, if I can make one point, that's safety. And this is something the modern agile guys are talking about a bit. Is you have to basically not just tell people we want a quick and dirty answer. If you do that and then there's a bit of a difference between the testing and the simulation, they'll only do that once if you throw them under the bus. You've got to actually write it down. You've got to actually say to them, that's right. If you could do something, if you could analyse this part, plus or minus 30%, I'd be happy with that. And often you're guessing at loads or estimating them early on in the process anyway. So write it down. One example I did, um, I was running an aerospace analysis team for a while and uh, I developed this massive 50 pages of calculations to calculate the fatigue life components. And we had this objective quality measure. This is how long the part would last. And we can compare that between brackets and bits and bobs. But each analyst also wanted to put in their own safety factor. And some were really conservative, some were a bit naive, and so you got this really user-dependent, poor quality result. So rather than ignoring the analyst, or having it wildly fluctuate depending on who did the work, we had always quoted two values. We had the calculated service life, which is a nice objective comparable measure, and we had the recommended service life, which sometimes were all over the show, but you can see who analysed it and usually work out why. A uh, quick case study, so this is a bogey I led the design on for Kira. Uh, it's a passenger bogey, so one of those goes at either end of the carriage. And uh, really safety critical. Uh, when a workmate told me that a train had derailed the other week down the road, uh, heart stopped. Always, <laughs> always freaks me out a little bit, but uh, it's actually really easy to uh, derail the damn things. So this we had about five people working on at times really agile, um, we converged in on the solutions, we had multiple analysis rounds, we simulated 30 years of um, running life and we actually tested for several months and actually uh, sort of proved that, made sure it wouldn't crack and so far it's been going really well, we haven't had any problems, we haven't had any derailments, touch wood. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, like I said, uh, when I began, never try and engineer, uh, never try to finance an engineer's curiosity. It's a losing battle. Um, but you know, with approaches like better by analysis and the agile methods, you can make a big difference. But the key is safety, making it safe to fail. Thank you. The, the calculations I did in that case study I mentioned at the start, $4,000, that was just Excel. And we actually gave the customer those calculations. And so the customer was able to use that as a little tool to design the rest of their product, rather than using the fancy math software we use. So CFD, FEA, MathTab, Hancock.